So good morning, everyone. I am truly delighted to welcome you to our first policy uh, breakfast of the semester. I'm especially excited about this policy breakfast, um, not only because of the importance of the issue and the, the brilliance of the, the panelists, but also because this is the first debate that we've had that um, ties very directly to the um, to our uh, Dream Revisited blog. And now I'm looking, where's the place? Good. Um, and uh, we've, we've launched the, the Dream Revisited blog um, uh, just over five years ago on MLK Day in 2014 with support from the Open Society Foundations. Um, and uh, our idea was to try to spur candid and constructive uh, dialogue and debate about issues related to housing segregation and, and opportunity. Um, the, the governing ideology in this country is that every child, no matter where she starts on the, on the economic ladder, no matter where she lives, should have access to the same set of opportunities. But as, as you all know, uh, the reality is far from this ideal, and, and arguably increasingly so, as income and wealth inequality grow in this country, the, the divides between, the gap between the resources provided um, by, by different neighborhoods grows as well. Um, and further, we thought that we were seeing um, a, a growing um, ideological, a widening ideological divide and sort of a, a digging in, um, in, uh, in, in discussions about the nature of these neighborhood disparities and policies to address them, especially with regard to race. Um, and we, we, too many of the debates we heard, we felt were either um, too tired or were, uh, or were sort of too, were either tired or, or too high level to really be useful for policy. And so we wanted to curate a set of fresh debates that would revisit some of these um, big picture issues like um, whether or not we should, uh, whether or not integration should be a goal in and of itself, what are the causes of, of um, of segregation um, with, with our own John Vogel sitting right here, um, and uh, what are the um, what are what are some of the consequences uh, of segregation on such outcomes as um, oh sorry where's that one I guess that one's missing some of the, the consequences of segregation on outcomes like on uh, on health disparities on access to financial. Uh, uh, to financial services and, and political discourse. Um, and, and we also wanted to include um, debates on, on very uh, specific and, and concrete policy issues like how to design and finance mixed income housing, right? With, with our own Carol Lambert, who's here in the audience. Um, and also how to, um, wh what's, what's the best way to help voucher holders reach, reach a broader set of neighborhoods. Um, in each of these debates, in each case, we invited somebody, uh, someone, in this case, um, Rob Collinson, to write an initial essay on the topic. And then we asked three additional people to who we thought would bring different perspectives to an issue to respond. Um, and all of these debates are, are, are available, are still available on, on the Furban Center's website. Um, and in addition, they're, they're now available um, in a new book that we have um, published that, that uh, builds off of the, the first 25 debates. Um, and it, it also, uh, it, it uh, edits the, the blogs, it, it, um, it sort of it organizes them th thematically, the debates, and then it, it also offers a new set of introductory essays to, that Justin Steele and I wrote that contextualize the debates and, and also sort of pull out key themes. Um, um, and I'm very happy to announce that we also just uh, relaunched the blog uh, with a 26th discussion about um, the issue of local control over land use de uh, decisions. Uh, it's a terrific discussion, and I encourage all of you to read, read the essays. Um, and um, in addition, um, many, but um, not all of the authors are here this morning for sort of a live debate, which we've never done. Um, on, uh, on this important issue. Um, we're also joined by Paula Siegel, um, a civil rights uh, lawyer who brings a wealth of relevant experience on this issue. 
and, um, and also um, my, my colleague, Vicki Bean, who of course, as always, will definitely moderate the uh, discussion and, and draw out the key areas of, of agreement and disagreement. Um, and, and I just want to end by saying that the, the core premise of our, of our policy breakfast series and also the Dream Revisited series is that policy dis uh, discussions about policy disagreements can be both um, civil and, and constructive, that, that we can learn from speaking to and listening to people with whom we disagree. Um, and so with that, I wanted to say um, enjoy the discussion and, and thanks very much for coming this morning. And there are a few seats up here in the front for those of you that are standing in the back. So thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Ingrid, and, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming. We're delighted to see uh, the interest in this topic. <coughs> Obviously, as uh, the city uh, considers charter revision, these are, are really important and uh, issues that could shape the nature of the city for decades to come. So we're, we're really delighted um, to see everyone here. Uh, we've got lots of knowledge and um, and talent both uh, up here uh, leading the discussion and, and in the audience. So um, on that, uh, I need to remember to, uh, to tell you that we will be, we'll have people circulating with um, uh, note cards and so you can write your questions on those as the, as, as the debate unfolds here and, or you can post on Twitter, whichever um, you prefer or however old you are, in the way. <laughs> the, or at least that's how I feel when I'm dealing with um, my kids and Twitter, right? Um, so, um, so we wanted to just, uh, you know, in the spirit that Ingrid talked about, I mean, the purpose of these policy debates is really to provide a safe space where we can dig deep, where we can really try to get specific and get beyond a lot of the generalities and sort of cliches that often mark our public debate. Um, in a safe space and in, in a constructive and, and civil way. So um, we're going to launch right in. Um, our aim today is really to discuss who should have power over, uh, lo over land use decisions, right? And by land use decisions, I mean everything from, uh, you know, whether a rezoning uh, should be approved um, to, uh, you know, uh, issues about even uh, variances and other things, but, but land use decisions about housing, um, about other kinds of, of uses. We'll, we'll start the conversation by really talking about some of the pros and cons of decision making at different levels of government. Obviously that's a key question on which our, um, our nation was founded and, and it imbues all of the constitutional and other principles um, as well as the relationship between s states and their local governments and, and between local governments and their neighborhoods. So we'll delve into the question of the merits of allowing very local or sublocal um, units to make decisions instead of, so the city instead of the state, neighborhoods or other sublocal jurisdictions instead of the city or the local government. Um, and uh, we're going to start with the city-state issue, and then we're going to move to the city and then um, its sublocal uh, uh, areas. So there are um, those of the students in the room who are in state and local government or take land use or, or debate these issues. There are textbook explanations about what, which decision maker is best to make various kinds of decisions and when you want decisions to be at a more centralized level and when you want them to be at a more decentralized level. So the theory goes that local residents have a better understanding of how a particular land use or a particular proposal will affect their neighborhood and they also will tend to be the ones who are bearing the most of the costs of any land use that, that happens in their neighborhood. Um, whereas the benefits often will be spread throughout the city or perhaps even um, spread throughout the state. Um, on the other hand, each um, local government and its <coughs> residents um, may act only in its interests and forget the interests or ignore <coughs> the interests of the larger population, the state or the city, depending on what we're talking about, and pay uh, too little attention um, to those uh, sort of broader societal needs. Or 
um, even worse, and, and uh, you know, going to the theme of the dream revisited, each neighborhood or other uh, you know, sublocal um, unit may act in ways that, um, uh, that are discriminatory, that concentrate poverty in, uh, in, in certain areas of the jurisdiction, and uh, councilmatic vetoes or other forms of sublocal or neighborhood control can drive uh, really segregation and the concentration of poverty within a jurisdiction. So some, ju some decisions need to be made at either at the state level rather than the city level or at the city level rather than a sublocal or neighborhood level. Um, but, um, and some decisions are better really made um, at that local level. And so our goal today is to tease that out with, um, with some level of specificity. Um, so how do we avoid, to put, to put it all back together, how do we get that expertise at the local uh, and sublocal level um, while avoiding the parochialism, nimbyism, and prejudice that might occur um, if we allow land use decisions to be made at that sublocal level? So that's the general theory. So I want to start with my um, wonderful panelists, and their bios are all in the in the materials that you have on your seats, so I'm not going to spend time on that there, except to say that it's hard to imagine um, a better panel and a, and a, a panel with um, a, a more diverse set of views. Um, so, um, so let me just launch right in. Do I have that basic theory about the pros and the cons of decentralized versus centralized um, uh, government decisions right, or are there uh, other things that you think should be on the table. So, David. So, um, I think you have it right, although I, there are other dimensions that are worth noting mm -hmm. um, that I think will help inform the discussions going forward. The biggest one is that when you move local or up, you don't just change the scope the scope of the decision maker, but you very much change the identity of the decision makers. Um, as elections get smaller, either elections or uh, participation gets smaller, it's much more likely to be, the hev more heavily invested parties are more likely to participate. Those of you who know local government law know something called the home voter hypothesis, that in local elections, people who own homes are the most likely to vote um, to, in order to protect the value of their homes. This is true for participation in um, uh, sublocal um, decision making, people who show up at city, at, at, uh, at a land use decision meet, whatever, the, whatever governing mechanism you have. Um, as you move higher, um, we have mechanisms for uh, aggregating weakly attached opinion. So we have political parties that uh, actually cut and are competitive, and governors and mayors are well known enough that people can, even people who are not heavily invested and not he information rich can um, develop opinions about a de Blasio or a, um, or a Cuomo in ways that's very hard to about uh, the people on your community board. And so the, while the scope of decision making has effects on the kind of whether it's uh, just for the neighborhood with its information, with a kind of no, no, local knowledge versus you know, uh, broader interests, but lack of that in the local knowledge, it also cuts the direction of the kind of who's likely to be involved. Because as you get smaller, you're much more likely to get the uh, views of um, the most heavily invested, which are uh, usually um, uh, homeowners and uh, richer, whiter, socioeconomic, blah, blah, blah along those lines. And as you get higher, the interests of more transient, so renters, um, uh, uh, even people who are not from the jurisdiction might be interested in moving to the jurisdiction are more likely <coughs> to be involved. And so that's another dimension along which this, when you're making this the, the higher versus lower decision and decision making, it's worth taking note of how much do we care about um, uh, about the interests of less attached or less 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 heavily invested, already invested characters. I, as uh, as you, if you read the essays, know I'm a pretty strong proponent of centralized decision making. Um, uh, in, and one of the strong reasons for doing so is to uh, access the opinions of, say, renters and uh, the broader inter employers and other interests that are less heavily invested at the time. Okay. So as. Huey Long would say, if you don't vote, you don't matter, and which level of government we're talking about um, uh, determines who actually turns out not just to vote, but to participate as well. Elaine, did you want to jump in? Yeah, just a, a clarification. I wish that it was the sort of simple, and I will say simple, prejudice or nimbyism 
that is really the driver. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that you did not uh, talk about was the overlay of our system of white supremacy, which means that uh, the white people get to determine what whiteness is and then to systematically uh, discriminate against and, and, and kill uh, people that they deem not white. Mm -hmm. So that, the fact that we have that as a bedrock for the United States means that none of the decisions that you've talked about, whether it's um, higher level or more local, can escape that framework. And indeed, and, may map onto it, right? In that sometimes a state may be wider than a city, right? Um, and, but, but also, it's not a matter of these individuals got it wrong this time, mm -hmm. and, the, and maybe next time they'll get it right. The thing is, mm -hmm. with structural racism, they're always getting it right. It works as it is intended to work. And so that becomes an added challenge, because if we don't actually, I mean, and some people don't even acknowledge white supremacy, so if we don't acknowledge it, don't understand it, aren't trying to systematically fight against it mm -hmm. at whatever level, it will severely limit our ability to have um, really based on the merit kinds of discussions and policy making et cetera. So, so let me ask you, let me just follow up on, on both of those comments by asking the, the entire panel, is there anyone who, on the panel, who believes that the state should make all decisions about land use and, this, and the local government make none? Hearing none. <laughs> the city should make all decisions and neighborhoods should make none about land use? Okay, so we've, we've, we've pared <laughs> down. We're, we're making progress. Let's just, let's just put it that way. But now let's let, let's try to zone in on that and uh, home in on that. Sorry. Um, and and um, and get more specific. So when should a state be able to trump the local government in making a land use decision? Um, so let's start with affordable housing. Should the state be able to dictate? how much affordable housing a local government must provide. So let me, uh, let me start, uh, Paula, let me start with you. Um, okay, so that seems like a question that's really about what the, setting the floor, right? Setting the floor for what municipalities then require people who are building housing in their, in their area to do. Well, and that seems fine. Not require, but allow. I changed your question. Yeah. I know. <laughs> That's it. Not, I did that on purpose. <laughs> I, I understand. But the question is land use decisions, and the people who are making land use decisions are not the builders, right? So well, developers otherwise yeah, have to so, come. So New York City actually has an as of right land use paradigm. And New York mm -hmm. City is where I work. I'm an attorney for community-based organizations. And mostly what we're dealing with is a zoning resolution that we've inherited from 1961 mm -hmm. that set out a set of rules and established a set of maps that tell the owners of properties what they're allowed to do without asking anybody's permission in the city, mm -hmm. right? The state could come in and then say, okay, great, you've got, an, you've got a z lot that's zoned residential, wonderful, you're gonna follow all of the bulk rules and you're gonna have residential use there because that's what the zoning resolution says, good for you. You don't need to go check with anybody at the Department of City Planning, but you do need to make sure that 20% of those residential units are deeply affordable and permanently so. And that seems fine with the system we have. What we're talking about when we talk about land use decisions in the city of New York is changes to and exceptions from those rules that we have inherited. Those rules are not necessarily good. They're not even, they reflect a structure of white supremacy. They reflect the ideas about the future that people had in 1961. But at this point, those are the baseline rules. And when we're talking about key decisions, the key decisions that people need to make now are who is involved when those rules are broken 
or when those rules are changed. Right? So that's, that's the basic thing that's going on in the city. And if the state wants to come in and say, oh, hey, you know what? Here's a different rule that cuts across all those other rules. That's wonderful. We'll take all the help we can get. OK. Um, Elaine, do you agree? The state should be able to impose or sh should be able to uh, <laughs> set a minimum right, that <laughs> local governments have to meet in order to enjoy other kinds of privileges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think that when we're talking about public goods and in this instance we're talking about housing, mm -hmm. which is a which should be a public good. I mean, it should be a right for people to be able to be housed uh, mm -hmm. safely. Uh, so yes, the the state seems like an upper level government mm -hmm. should have a role in saying that this is what we need for the people of New York State. Mm -hmm. Okay, John. Oh, great, and it's not so original, an idea. Mm -hmm. In California, Massachusetts, New Jersey in particular, it's been going on for decades. Right. Two percent, roughly 2% of the inventory of, a, of all housing. That's roughly 2% of all the housing in New Jersey um, is affordable, created out of state mandates as to every municipality mm -hmm. doing its fair share. Mm -hmm. to solve a statewide housing problem. Okay, so any disagreement that the state should be able to set a minimum percentage, a minimum share of housing in a jurisdiction that should be affordable? Hearing no debate. <laughs> well, I just want to make one little qualification very briefly, <laughs> which is just because the state doesn't, does it, does not mean you get a statewide perspective. There is a fantasy mm -hmm. that says if we create a regional government, like say the Council on Affordable Housing in New Jersey, mm -hmm. late lamented, that therefore <coughs> we'll have an ent entity that'll suppress NIMBYism. And that is completely um, dependent, whether you will actually get um, a housing law that will promote housing rather than retard it from the state, mm -hmm. really depends on the interest groups that show up. Mm -hmm. COA under Susan Bass Levin was dominated by suburban homeowners. And in fact, um, they were not much help in their fair shares for promoting um, a prospective need for um, affordable housing. And there's many other examples you can give of states not merely imposing rules that don't help with affordable housing, but affirmatively hurt. In California, there are statewide rules that require linkage fees for housing. And those are avidly used by neighbors, essentially to suppress housing by taxing new construction. Mm -hmm. um, well, so CICRA in New York State mm -hmm. is a favored tool of NIMBYs. Um, and so, and the multiple dwelling unit law from the state level limits heights in New York City for residential buildings and FAR. And so just because you bring in somebody who's called the state doesn't mean that it's not basically a NIMBY wolf in state sheep's clothing. <laughs> so, and usually what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So Paula, let me go back to you. If, if the state should be able to dictate how much, what share of affordable housing a local government should have and it, your proposal was essentially a, an inclusionary housing requirement, um, but many mm -hmm. states preempt their local governments from doing that. So uh, if you're going to allow the state to have power on that, you're, you, you could get either one of those results. The state could mm -hmm. mandate mm -hmm. a share of affordable housing, or a state could prevent local governments from mandating a share of housing. So how are you going to make that a one-way ratchet, which I take it is what you're asking for? Uh, well, I have a little bit of faith left in electoral politics, so that's, that's helpful. Well, in, in more than how many states preempt inclusionary housing? It's 16. Um, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a lot of state control. That is a lot of state control. Luckily, I work in New York. <laughs> so um, so I'm allowed to have a little bit of hope and faith in what's coming down the pike in the next couple of years for, from the state for the city, uh -huh. um, and I hope that what happens here in the next couple of years will then, like New Jersey, mm -hmm. serve as a model that other states can look to when they build their aspirations towards what kind of relationships they want to have between their state mm -hmm. and local governments. Um, Elaine, what about you? I mean, you also favor mm -hmm. state control, so do you favor it if the state is preempting local governments' attempts to build affordable, to allow the building of affordable housing? So I don't think we'll get very far in our discussion unless we um, say, for example, mm -hmm. that we're assuming 
that the body is going to be either pushed to or will have a more, um, be a more amenable to doing what we're talking about. Because we know that, and I think I said initially, um, there, this is much more complex than we're talking about. Yep. So the state can really screw up big time, and the you know local folks can can all you know can do the same. But I think we're talking about a, you know we're making a theoretical statement here that presumably, if it's going to work, it would probably work better at the state level. I, we are making a theoretical statement, but we're also designing institutional controls, right? A charter yeah. revision doesn't yep. go away when you get a government that you don't like. Mm -hmm. It's still there, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you're making a decision on the basis of institutional questions, right, as to which mm -hmm. is going to work best over the long run. That's right. right? Yeah. Through and ups and downs of <laughs> your political agreement with That's the right. particular government. That's right. right. You know, so. you have to take a bet. Right. So to speak. So, exactly. One thing I David. think would be worth throwing in is that the, again, this is the, the level of government is one thing, but the identity of the decision maker at that level uh, often is more important. So um, executives traditionally in the literature are so kind of considered to be more pro-growth institutions than legislatures who are more dependent on local preferences and kind of uh, idiosyncratic local preferences. And so when designing institutions either at the state or the local level, one important concern I think is, um, I think it's a, there's a very strong case for giving greater executive uh, power in these things. So whether that's to city planning vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the city council <coughs> or to the governor vis-a-vis -vis the legislature, um, that I think that one, you've seen moves like this in California recently, their regional housing needs allocation system uh, built in some degree of uh, exec greater executive ab ability to get executive action to push out those targets um, in very much intentionally, I think, um, to, um, I actually don't know what was the intention was, but it seemed intentional, to um, focus on the ability of the more pro-housing pro growth entity inside the system, the, the one that is likely to be more that way. Well, let's turn to that question of growth. So should the state have control rather than the local governments about how much a city grows? Let's say a city uh, um, is being considered for growth that would bring 25,000 jobs or so, <laughs> right? Um, is, that a, um, a, is that a matter for state control or local control? If, if I may jump in. Sorry, David. Um, but if we're talking about designing institutional systems, the question isn't just who, but how, right? And the key to democratic decision making about <coughs> land use, which is the fundamental question of how places are formed, is to borrow a concept from the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous P Peoples, meaningful local consultation, right? And that means real negotiation the kind where everybody comes to the table with an idea of what they want and nobody leaves with that. Everybody leaves feeling like they lost a little bit, right? And that's when you know that you can move forward, right? And that meaningful local consultation has to happen before decisions are announced, certainly. It has to happen before there's a notification that something's going through a decision-making process, which is a baseline requirement, and it has to happen before any kind of review in public by decision-makers, which, which we have gotten through our electoral process, which we have in the city, right? We have this uniform land use review process, which lets us watch our city planning commission and our city council do some negotiation for us by proxy, but that's not meaningful consultation. That's observation, that's mm -hmm. transparency, that's great. <coughs> Those are baseline things we need, but in order to design a system that really works for true land use decisions, decisions about place, we need to bake in meaningful local consultation between the state and the city, between the city and its sub portions and make sure that that is a real negotiation. I literally couldn't disagree anymore. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, that thing. structure of multiple levels and multiple processes is how you end up with a jurisdiction that grows unbelievably slowly. That as you add all of these steps, you add costs. And so one thing I find interesting about New York exceptionalism 
um, uh, is uh, New York is one, New York City is one of the slowest New York, New York City region is one of the slowest growing rich regions in the country. People make fun of San Francisco. New York City on a per capita basis grows at half the rate of San Francisco. <coughs> half the rate of San Francisco. To get that through your head, it's crazy. And one one explanation for that is the, exactly these levels of process. And adding more to this and lording this up more will result in less housing. And so, on some fundamental level, mm. um, um, uh, the added that the, that focusing on ever adding ever more steps to the process is something that will um, result in much, much less housing and much higher housing costs at the aggregate level. But yep. David, your presumptions are wrong. Renters in New York are not transient. So you have to deconstruct the model from there. Yeah, but may I chime in on renters and in general the mass, what I call maximum feasible participation model? Because I want to second David on this. If you create formal procedures that have maximum procedure and a lot of transactional politics, you actually minimize procedure. Because you know who do not show up? Renters. Um, there's lots of data from Milwaukee to DC to San Francisco. Renters are not showing up. Who dominates your community boards? It's largely going to be homeowners, often white homeowners in majority black neighborhoods. It's crazy, but it's completely explicable by down payments. And one of the basic f a aspects of land use interest is that the interests who show up are the interests who have skin in the game, which means that if you have highly costly participation, what you're going to end up with is participation by a few big developers who can afford the lobbyists necessary to engage in the kinds of huge multi-year negotiations over FAR. Um, and that squeezes out smaller developers who just can't afford it, and especially out-of-town developers. And on the consumer side, the people who are going to show up are going to be homeowners, brownstoners, older people, wider people. Why? Well, older people can afford to show up at that participation. They don't have three jobs. And people who have down payments have an incentive to show up. So you create a framework where it looks like you're having massive participation, and it turns out that about 5% of the people are showing up and dominating the process, and it shouldn't surprise you that those 5% have kept New York City at an unbelievably slow growth rate in housing. But thank you all so for coming. John, um, so let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me turn to John, who's had a great deal of experience with um, local, building local public participation. John. So the, the <laughs> there's several presumptions that you're making. One is that the top-down decision maker is benign. It, uh, it's, it's almost like the, uh, what was it, the, the philosopher prince? And in fact, that person and those set of interests, as you were describing, mm -hmm. are not necessarily benign. Mm -hmm. We could be talking about imposing, if it was Giuliani, imposing his will to create arenas, just as much as we, or Robert Moses, to build a highway that won't accommodate buses that can take black people to the beach. We can be talking about a lot of different things in terms mm -hmm. of the top down. What I've found consistently um, is that developers want predictability. So it is possible through a cross-acceptance approach where you have state, county, regional, New York City, which functions as a region, New York City policies that set out guidelines and expectations and provide a means for appeal while leaving the decision <coughs> to a local entity. I won't say what scale yet, because I know that's a later question. Mm -hmm. But while leaving the, um, the preliminary this, this decision to a local entity, again with an appeal, and the predictability is provided through plans, which um, New York City has decided it does not do master plans. But every other municipality I've worked in, in the Northeast, does plans, and that creates a framework for predictability that is akin to a totally as of right zoning ordinance which, which resolution, which is what we use in New York City. So it, a cross acceptance where there's policies that are fully vetted with localities, full consultation, Con localities have control over the immediate decision, but answerable through an appeal to, the, uh, to a higher level, creates the cross acceptance and it can be streamlined and it can be insulated from the cupidity of transactional um, approvals. Mm -hmm. So John, let, let's, um, I always think that discussions are better when they get specifics yeah. because it's, it's just too easy to think that we're agreeing or know we, um, what the nature of our disagreement is um, if we don't get specific. So to get specific, right, if you had a plan in the city of New York, I can assure you 
that that plan would say we should attract uh, high paying jobs, right? So, so to what, not, so, the, the, so, so let me get use, my, oh, I, let me get to the, to the, the question, to the yeah. real, so <laughs> if we have, so that's the, the nature of comprehensive planning is that it's a bunch of quite vague, because it has to be, because it has to predict the future, quite vague goals, right? So you, if you have a quite vague goal, like, we should attract good jobs, right. right? Then how is that going to help when a city and a state are thinking about should we grow to attract some what we consider to be good jobs? I would argue consistent that consistent with your yeah. you know, with your public participation. I would argue that the case in point of the magic twenty five thousand jobs was mm -hmm. actually a failure of politics, mm -hmm. not yeah. a failure <laughs> of process. Okay. The governor and the mayor who by all accounts are feuding, uh -huh. we're so busy figuring out how to share credit that, and making an assumption that Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, that, it, that the large employer, <laughs> nameless, <laughs> <laughs> um, would, 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 it would be so inviting that everyone would forget everything that's gone before. Okay, but as I understood um, Paula's argument, as a, and as I understood your argument, in making that kind of decision, we should oh. have some process oh. for. Sure. If, if you're saying a master plan is a, is a mom and apple pie statement, like there should be affordable housing, there should be non discrimination, we should have economic, uh, upwardly mobile jobs, mm -hmm. yeah, that's not a plan. That, that's a statement of goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. A plan would get down to the level of specificity mm -hmm. that would allow predictability. So, what would be the and level of specificity that we would have needed? to have the kind of public participation that you, and, and I take it, Paula, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, are talking about. With regard to With regard a to employer. a major employer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why uh, there was a process that could have been used in a roundabout way already mm -hmm. in, the, in the sense that there was a line of authority, of consultation and authority who could have been consulted in advance to take a pulse. Who, and, who do you have in mind? Well, the, um, clearly the community board leadership, the borough president, the council member, the president of the council. Oh, dear God. But that's <laughs> David's point, right? If you're negotiating with a major employer, you can't say, and just one second, let me go through a 60-day process with a community no, board. That I, I don't think the problem with that was EULA. Okay. I think the problem of that major employer was that Amazon's main concern was not having a precedent of union wages. Okay, and I, don't they want, discovered, I don't want to discuss Amazon. Okay, I don't enough. want to get into <laughs> right, what right, Amazon right. did wrong and what you know, the elected yeah. officials. Yeah. So the, idea, the idea I, that... I think the problem with what you're describing is, what's it called, a black swan? Can I, can it's I just, so can unique I, mm. that it's hard to say that the, the system actually can predict for someone coming from the wet from another region saying we're going to bring 25,000 jobs. But having said that, there is a way you could create a process for, um, for streamlining in the event of something of this nature. But I, I would actually turn more Can to I the jump? lawyers to figure that one out. What was the oh. land use decision at stake there? Oh, that's good. Um, we never even found out what they were going to be. We were still talking about the business level decisions in terms of tax credits and kind of big well, numbers being use, thrown around. But the land use decision was exactly the streamlining process that John just talked about, which is take it out of the city's land use process and move it into the Empire State Development Corps process. Right? That was the streamlined decision. That's right. So no notification, so, no review in public by our local entities that are entrusted to do that, and certainly no meaningful consultation. That's where, that's where we landed, right? State control <laughs> Great. with consultation with the city's mm -hmm. leaders. Yeah, I mean, keep right? in mind, you're going to get a scoping hearing. You get, well, you get secret, <laughs> you get a scoping hearing, but you're going to have to decide about how much you want. If you want infinite levels, you're going to get infinite levels of NIMBYism. If you want streamlined, you get secret scoping hearings from the state. Um, when you ever you bypass Euler, but basically you go into the, it's called fast track, it ain't that fast, um, it involves lots of negotiation with neg decks and, you know, um, basically trying to get out of the EIS. And developers give out goodies for that sort of stuff. 
But it's impossible to say you want streamlining unless you want to limit participation. You can't have it both ways. Um, and so when anybody says streamlining, I want to, I, and they say it all the time, developers just want predictability. And everybody says, yeah, we just want predictability. But what developers predictably want is a flat tax on development that's fairly low. And what neighbors predictably want is a park, a school, a fire truck, um, tons of affordable housing, and maybe the developer just walks and they don't care, right? And so it just seems to me that um, the apolitical idea that streamlining will somehow be able to manage, be managed without facing the um, dictatorship of the down payment um, and the homeowners um, seems to me like pie in the sky. Okay, David, and then uh, given that we've reached such consensus on this issue, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna move we, to the we local We can just level. move on, we can just go on. I, I've got, I, I, we can okay. go on forever. So we agreed maybe that um, a state might want, might possibly should have control over how much or what share of affordable housing, although we talked about some of the dangers of that in states that are going in the mm -hmm. other direction. We can't agree on growth more generally. Is there anything else that it's clear that the state should be able to decide? Let's say that the state wants to close down an obsolete prison um, and has an idea of where that prison should go, in or a new prison should go in order to allow that prison to be closed down? <laughs> um, should a state be able to say over a local government's objections, it goes here, this is the best place for it? Yes? Can no? I just jump in for a sec? Mm -hmm. I think the part of the issue with the previous discussion and what can happen with this next discussion <laughs> is that um, because it hasn't worked right, from, from, from either perspective. Uh -huh. um, it's like we can't imagine that it could work right. Mm -hmm. And so it, once you add on that somebody, that the state makes the final decision or has the power over or something like that, it really does limit what I think would be a very useful discussion mm -hmm. about what is the discussion that we should be having about the public goods, including housing, with its specificity about this kind of housing to, you know, for these kinds of people, uh, jobs, these kinds of jobs, mm -hmm. you know, with people with these kinds of skills, and, you know, how do we, if we could reach an understanding about that and people could have some level of agreement on the numbers and on the types and all of that, then I think some process, which is the state looking more at the overall and then sub entities mm -hmm. really thinking about, okay, well, with our area, blah, 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 and having discussion with, with people about that. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's, it's a little, I understand, you know, why you're doing it. You're trying to, you know, you're trying to push this to, you know, to get to a very specific kind of decision about the state gets to decide. And I think it's very hard to have that because we haven't had the other more important decisions, I think, more important discussions and decisions. So I, I totally agree. It's really hard to have these conversations separate from each other, although at the end of the day, somebody has to make a decision when there isn't consensus. Mm -hmm. John? So to turn to and your- And the state would at the end of the day. Okay. So to turn to your, to your example, mm -hmm. um, again, the way it's being posed is, is a wise state dealing with parochial interests. That's not always the case. Exactly. Mm -hmm. For sure. And um, in fact, it's especially not the case with regard to siding of NIMBYs which tend to uh, raise all sorts of issues about environmental justice, loading up the NIMBYs in neighborhoods that do not have as much political clout. So um, the predictability there would have to come from well-reasoned plans and policies that, to which on some <coughs> level, politically, a state, is, state leadership is accountable to. Otherwise, it's simply a question of taking the NIMBY out of this district and putting it 
over there because those are the people who voted for you and those were the people who didn't vote for you. So to move to a local level, right, at, at the state level, as far as I know, um, we don't have any proposals for institutional design that would require cities to have a comprehensive plan or that kind of thing, but we do have that discussion going on at the city level. So let's turn to the city versus the neighborhoods, the sublocal um, issues. So, uh, and let's, let's really, well, let, let's do a, a few definitional questions, right? So the first question is, what do we mean by a neighborhood or a sublocal? If we're talking about who gets to make a decision about, let's say, just for example, where a new jail might go in order to allow the closing of another obsolete jail. Um, so if we're talking about who gets to make that decision, the city or the neighborhood, what do we mean by a neighborhood? So I think that for our understanding of neighborhoods, um, and kind of generally, but also in New York City, the most important neighborhood official is the city council person. And the basic reason why is that these decisions eventually have to go through the city council, and the city council works uh, because of a whole variety of um, uh, uh, institutional facts about local politics uh, ends up deferring to the decisions of this council person who control, who represents that area. Um, and in that case, the other alternative is a citywide entity, that there are all variety of other potential sub-local institutions, but the ultimate power resides in um, the city council person. And that for the perspective of producing what, pe what people in land use call LULUs, locally unwanted land uses, there's a lot of evidence that the move to districted elections results in, um, from at-large elections, has resulted in less production, so homeless shelters. There's a great paper by a Engelmeyer, I believe, that shows that when jurisdictions move from district to, uh, from at-large elections to district elections, they produce less, few, or fewer, sorry, rather fewer, um, uh, locally unwanted land uses. So that's uh, homeless shelters, garbage dumps, whatever it is that people don't want in their neighborhood. Um, and the this gives reason, and there are a lot of reasons to have district elections, and I'm not opposed to them, um, but this gives, um, or always, um, uh, this gives a, a good reason for understanding, thinking that for, particularly with respect to Lulu's, that citywide rather than districted elect, districted decision makers should be, uh, we should get, we should empower them rather. So, Paula, do you agree? Is the is the city council person for a council district the neighborhood and should be allowed to make the decision? I don't agree with that, but I actually agree with a lot of what David just said. I just want to reframe a little bit. Uh, what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's great. It's okay, great. I want to know. I want to know who the yeah. neighborhood is. is you want to know who the neighborhood is. I don't want to. So I don't the know about uh, I will. I, I'll answer that question also. Um, so first of all, when we're talking about making changes to existing predictable zoning rules or granting exemptions to them, which our mayor has done without any kind of notification, right? Remember mayoral zoning overrides? Okay, that doesn't go to the council. Remember the question. Yep, Mama. I do. Okay. Um, so first of all, folks are free to self-identify as, hey, you know what? We're impacted by this. We're going to propose a change. Of course, when you're talking about citing a jail, it's very unlikely that people are going to get together in their neighborhood and say, hey, you know what? We would be a great site for a jail. But on the other hand, the Van Allen Institute has put forward some wonderful concepts of what neighborhood-based community service centers that include places where people can be held in detention would look like. And some neighborhoods might actually want those, right? If that idea of a jail with other mm -hmm. amenities was actually out there as something that neighborhoods could ask for, some might, so right? And the city the council quest member wants a jail and, the, and those people say, we don't want a jail, who decides? Okay, so what David just described in terms of our, in terms of our councilmatic prerogative and, uh, on land use decisions, that's an extremely abbreviated version of local consultation, right? You have somebody that somebody who's proposing a change can actually negotiate with, but they can't do it until the very end of a process that's ba where basically what's left to be negotiated is not the site, it's not the basic parameters of the project, but it's kind of the paint job, right? And maybe some of the small numbers. 
If that can be expanded, then certainly the council member needs to have a role, but not just at the very end, but at the beginning of the process. The community boards are an existing, perfectly viable vehicle for figuring out who needs to be in the room at the beginning. Who, not they're not necessarily the ones that represent the most impacted people on every project, but they are in a good position to say, you know what? We're going to figure out who those people are and we're going to make sure that they're at the table with the decision maker. And depending on the kind of project, whether it's a slight upzoning on a mid block or it's the siting of a jail, you're going to get a bigger and sm or smaller group. So, but just to be clear, the city, the community district, the community board right now has advisory power but not veto power. You're content with that? I'm not talking about what's going on inside of the land use review process, which is a process that is only designed to make sure the public has access to what the decision makers are thinking. I am talking about what happens long before that. I am talking about before an application, a draft application for changes or exemptions is submitted to either the Board of Standards and Appeals or the Department of City Planning. Right. And Once the application itself is finalized, the train's kind of left the station. And yes, it may be advisory power. I almost say, who cares what's happening inside ULERP as long as what's, what happens before ULERP is truly meaningful. OK, and that takes us back to the discussion of process and, and, but, and who the actual decision maker is. But Elaine wanted to jump in. Yeah, so since I'm from a suburban area, uh, we have loads of neighborhood or variations of neighborhood control. Uh, they might have the name of a village, uh, even, um, and which is, you know, very tiny. But that process has been uh, notorious for really promoting the status quo, which, to go back to my opening remark, is the status quo, status quo of, of white, sim, white supremacy run amok. Um, really very racially segregated uh, communities on Long Island. We're among the 10th most racially segregated metro region. And I say metro, I mean, that's what census calls us. And we are. We're almost 3,000. I realize, I mean, you know, three million rather. I realize we're tiny in comparison to New York City, but that's still a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely do not think that the neighborhood level decision making around all of these public goods uh, is the preferable mechanism. And we have to look at the reality of what, of what has happened. So after a while, you have to say, OK, we keep getting the same result. Why do we think that this process is really going to change, given all of the other parameters uh, related here? Mm -hmm. So John, can I ask you to come in on this question of who is the neighborhood? You dealt, John was involved in negotiating the uh, community uh, process for Essex Street, right, um, and other places. So who represents the neighborhood? Is it, can we give that decision making, whatever the process is, but somebody at the end has to make a decision? Should it be the city council member? Should it be the, who else? Uh, clearly in, in very, up until the question of who makes the final decision, I was with you. <laughs> um, I think the problem. I want to know who we can hold accountable, right? I want to well, know who end, gets to make the decision at the end of the day. At the end of the day, because of the powers of condemnation, um, et, et cetera, in the end of the day, it's going to be whoever has the highest office with an implementation tool. What do you mean an implementation? Well, if it's, you see, I think the problem the that we're- The highest elected office, which would be the city council member. Well, it, the city council member at present only has a veto to the extent to which the uh, mutual agreement of council people that they will vote as a block, right. mm -hmm. which was the equivalent of what the Board of Estimate used to do back in the day when each borough president would vote with the other borough presidents. So, and that's a form of, uh, and it's an interesting form of power because it means that the uh, that that as a block they can depart 
from what the single council member wants mm -hmm. if they feel that there's a political consequence. So if it was overtly racist or overtly not in the city's interest, theoretically, the rest of the council would not vote as a block. But I, I think the problem here is that we're mixing um, big piece of watermelon with a lemon by, <laughs> by in the same paragraphs talking about affordable housing and prisons. Yeah. And <laughs> the and also I would agree with Paula that we're talking about the moment of community review for a proposal mm -hmm. when we really should be talking about the much earlier moment when you create the plans and the frameworks and the consultation that goes in advance of those decisions. If, okay, so if let's, you're let's in the moment, there. you always mm -hmm. are dealing with expediency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it as opposed to rationality. So let's go there. Let's assume that we had a perfect process where early in, I, we're going to assume arguendo without uh, admitting as to the truth or falsity of the following claim. <laughs> let's assume arguendo that today's system is too late, uh, too late and too many other things, right? So we had an earlier system where the neighborhood, however it's defined, we still haven't agreed on that, but however it's defined is involved early on, right? And the neighborhood says, we don't want any jails. And the city council and the mayor say, we need to have jails in order to close Rikers, which is the humane, et cetera, thing to do. Um, and this is where the best place for the jail is. Who decides? Okay. Early, we're early on, uh, and we already uh, have a conflict, okay. right? All right, so in this case, the question of transparency is actually very important. Uh -huh. If the city said, here's our site location criteria, does everyone agree with it? And then uh, in a cross-acceptance way say, well, you know, they have a point, but they have a point that we, don't, that we have to make a choice, there's a trade-off, we're not gonna go with their point, and that third point is just plain stupid. And there's a cross-acceptance. Well, in the end, for something like citing a prison, it's going to be the, the, uh, the, the city because the alternatives are not in one neighborhood. If you're talking about affordable housing, the alternatives can be in one neighborhood. So, okay. mm -hmm. you know, that, that's why I say it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a big watermelon versus a lemon. It's easy mm -hmm. to cite a lemon. A big watermelon, it may not fit on that tiny co cocktail table. Well, okay. So I would say it, it's a question of proportionality. Okay, but as I heard it, early yeah. in the process, if we have a major disagreement, the right. city decides not the neighborhood. Mm -mm. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. And I also think if we st stuck to our principles um, and everybody could get a jail, I mean, if we decided that, you know what, we really need jails that are not hundreds of people or however many are in a jail, but we need jails that are smaller, mm -hmm. that look like a house, mm -hmm. but obviously have very strong bars and all that other stuff that we want for protection. But I mean, I, and I'm being a little, only a little facetious, mm -hmm. um, then everybody would, it, it would push, that, I'm not saying that people would say, please bring the jail to my place, but I'm saying it would push people to say, okay, I could get the, I could get the jail next week, you know? And so let's make sure that we have agreement on what the jails are going to look like, right. how they're going to function within the community, um, what you get when you get a jail. And it wouldn't make it a seamless process, but I think it would allow us to live with whatever, the, whatever happened. Yep. Uh, I have a feeling we probably have some disagreement on, that on those process issues. Is that correct, or is everybody in agreement? Oh, we already said what we had to say. That's fine. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's we should probably move on. Yeah. Well, can I actually just add a little detail? Uh -huh. I've, um, we do have a city planning commission. It mm -hmm. is empowered to file applications for the city as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about applications for land use actions. And that city planning commission can take fair share principles into account when it does its citing. And then it is then responsible for hosting the meaningful community consultation. Right, not just a hearing at the end, but something truly, truly meaningful where community members are involved in design decisions. But in a world where the city council does defer, 
-hmm. and the ultimate decisions are citywide in that process, then there's no way around this problem that you can, again, this is like, there's a lot of, you, you, there, you can build lots of methods and other things, but ultimately the problem is that we have a political system in which we defer substantially to locals. Um, and locals in the form of the city council person. And like, we can think about ways to challenge that or change, but the, the, there's a lot of dressing around the problem um, that is, uh, you know, I think ultimately doesn't help you see at the core of the issue. Um, you know, jails is an interesting one because you can imagine a distribution, but lots of things you can't. So for, um, for uh, a lot of things that are big, gonna be huge economies of scale. And I don't know enough about jails to know about that, uh, but um, uh, you know, for lots of other Lulus, you're gonna need to have big institutions and that's gonna be a citing problem no matter what, you know, it's gonna, and you're gonna need to make this local versus citywide decision. I mean, we have uh, this problem at the national level with nuclear waste. It's, a, it's an endemic problem and you can't talk your way around it with consultation and, you know, other stuff. Well, so, so let's, let's just move to the $64,000 question, which is, Given that this is an institutional design issue, that we've got a design for good times and bad times, right, um, according to your political calculation, then what kinds of things should the Charter Revision Commission be thinking about do changing um, in terms of the institutional design? So um, let me just start with, to go back to where we started on the state, should the Charter Revision Commission require, for example, the city council to set minimums about how much affordable housing a, a neighborhood, let's say that we're gonna define it by council district or community district, um, that w should they be able to set targets um, for how much, or minimum requirements, for how much affordable housing a neighborhood should have to have? Um, and how are we gonna get around, in a charter revision type of way, how are we gonna get around the possibility of councilmatic of deference to the council member of councilmatic veto. So I don't think it should be limited to affordable housing. I think that the city should. Uh, this is a proposal that Rick and I have developed over the years called we call zoning budgets. That the city sh as a whole and pr the city planning commission realistically should propose a needed amount of overall housing, um, and that the city council would vote on the total amounts, and then the city council could the city would distribute this across its variety of political subdivisions, um, council manic districts in this case, and the, you could, in order to, uh, until you met this target, you couldn't, you could never approve down zonings, um, and you'd, ha you'd have to have some kind of fast track approval until the housing target that the city itself set. Um, uh, and given this, if you wanted to propose some change, you have to propose somewhere else in the city for it to go. And so that's the basic structure of the idea, which it doesn't require every district to have something necessarily, so much as it requires, if you're going to deviate from your target, you've got to identify somewhere in somewhere else's district to put it. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that this would force conflict um, and would force negotiation, that you can't just say, not here and I don't know where, but rather, you know, um, but n if not here, in your district. And then that would, in, would create, create this type of conflict that we think would be healthy and would leave the city council and the city in its proper decision-making role um, of figuring out not technical issues, but broader policy questions about the overall amount of housing the city needs. So, so let me get people's proposals to deal with that problem out on the table and then we can go back to questions that one uh, panel member has about another panel member's uh, suggestions. So um, Paula, let, let's go to you in terms of uh, are there things that should be done in the Charter Revision Commission to require the city to specify for each neighborhood what their share of housing is? Um, do you have proposals about how that would work or whether that should be? I'm trying to figure out where in the flow of housing development that would actually fit since most housing development happens as of right, right? So I think that what we can do is regulate the developers, right? The one most folks are building as of right, they're not asking anybody's permission, they're not changing the zoning. Tell them they gotta build something affordable. And let's talk about what that should be. Um, I really wanna drive home the point that zoning isn't actually development. Zoning is dreams about the future. Some of that, those futures are soon. Some of them are far away. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually, I've heard, we have the zoning to house 12 million people 
in the city of New York. I am not a planner. I have not done that calculation myself. But we have lots of unused zoning that hasn't been utilized. That's interesting. Does, that sounds to me like zoning isn't the issue. Something else is. So, so your proposal is a mandatory inclusionary housing imposed on everybody even as of right development? Yeah, sure, why okay. not? That sounds great. <laughs> Rick? Um, I would say that you don't want to focus on neighborhoods but on citywide goals. As soon as you bring in the neighborhoods, you bring in hydraulic forces that will cause the mm -hmm. housing goals to be forced downward. I would point out also that the, po the proposal Paula just made was made in New Jersey. It was called growth share. The idea was, if you build, a certain percentage must be affordable. And the New Jersey Supreme Court quite rightly struck that down as an obviously exclusionary device. Um, and the reason, of course, is the developer always has a choice of just not building, building less. And the neighbors were imposing inclusionary requirements in order to make sure that developers didn't build. In fact, the New Jersey Supreme Court, in trying to defend Mount Laurel, often considered to be the most pro-housing um, opinion heroically faced down Chris Christie and his Council on Affordable Housing by saying, you shall not require a percentage higher than 25%. Because any percentage higher than that was obviously exclusionary. So I think you need to worry about any proposals that make building affordable housing conditional on whether developers build, because there's plenty of neighbors who are perfectly happy to have developers build nothing whatsoever. And I also think you need to be very careful about having neighborhood-specific housing goals because that mobilizes neighbors like a kicked hornet's nest. Um, David and I's proposal for a zoning budget is a citywide budget where that we say over the entire city, the zoning envelope must include housing of such a variety in, 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 in certain transit-rich zones. And once you set that goal and make it an ironclad goal that when not met automatically entitles a developer to a map amendment, that's my happy, you know, addition, my dream world, that would be something worth putting in a charter and it could have a very big effect. Okay, so citywide targets but a, an ability to, of, the, of a local developer, of a developer on a local site to invoke those citywide targets? Yeah. Okay. Elaine? Yeah, so I can't speak to the city charter, but mm -hmm. I can uh, say that in suburban areas like Long Island, Nassau and Suffolk County, we would love to have some as of right mm -hmm. <laughs> abilities. Um, the only thing that's as of right is single family homes. And I do think that I lean more toward um, having it all over, requiring it all over, and then that there is some process perhaps to um, under extreme circumstances, there needs to be some accommodation. But that's really extreme. It can't just be that we don't want that housing uh, kind of a thing. And it can't, and it can't be some of the, um, some of the things that are, that are brought out you know, around, oh, that means we're gonna have too many kids in the school. I mean, I always thought that schools were for educating children, but that's, <laughs> that's one of the ones that they bring out. We're going to have more children coming to the school, uh, et cetera. Right, and i channeling Rick here for a minute. He would say we have to learn from the experience in New Jersey where uh, neighborhoods did come out with sudden uh, profound interest in environmental protection, et cetera, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that trumped uh, affordable housing. John. <clears throat> Your premise at one point was that uh, we'd have wild disagreements, and what I just heard was a consistent agreement. If you, you could add up what everyone said mm -hmm. and craft one policy around that. So I'll just add to that as opposed to debating. Um, you cannot divorce land use decisions from capital budget and operational decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to attend to things like if new schools are needed, if new parks are needed. Right mm -hmm. now, the with its only power being um, land use decisions. Mm -hmm. The Department of City Planning is effectively the Department of Zoning. And to the extent that it actually wants to be proactive, it's the Department of Upzoning. So <laughs> um, unless it gets back the capital budget control or there's some other mechanism for interagency and long-term planning where you're coordinating the capital and operating budget with land use decisions, uh, we're putting uh, we're creating a sharper 
debate that is necessary. I was inspired, uh, I think it was Paula, but it might have been Elaine, uh, this <laughs> description of how we could That's make look uh, even yeah. prisons, <laughs> well, that if every, <laughs> if every community was in fear of getting a prison, we would rethink how we do prisons, and we would design them so that if they're not a inherently beneficial use, there's certainly a less harmful use in the neighborhoods where they go. We both said that. And mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> the same thing goes with housing. So l let me probe on that and then I, uh, I'll probe a little bit and, and um, please get your cards in. We're gonna turn to um, uh, questions from the audience. But when you say, um, you know, the capital budget, so one proposal that's being discussed in the Charter Revision Commission is making the ca giving the capital budget more uh, weight as a plan, uh, more like a comprehensive plan. Is that something that you would favor? For sure. Anyone else? Rather than, a, let me put it more starkly, rather than a separate comprehensive plan, um, can we rely on the capital budget as our comprehensive plan? Certainly not. <laughs> oh <my> <laughs> Those are good. Right. You disagreed with yourself. That was awesome. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Excellent panel behavior over there. <laughs> so why not? On your latter point, <laughs> why won't? Why can't a capital budget, which allocates where the roads go, so, where the schools mm, go, et cetera, et cetera, why isn't that sufficient for a comprehensive plan? Well, think about who prepares what. Um, the, the Office of Management Budget and anyone who's responsible for capital budget will have fiscal responsibility as their primary concern as opposed to impacts, as opposed to long-term economic health, right? as opposed to any other specific interest. So if the capital budget involved all those other agencies and wasn't just coming from OMB? It, um, could you merge a capital budget with a, a master plan with a master plan for the land use? Yeah. Okay. That's, in fact, the way it's normally done outside yeah. of New York City. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to turn to um, questions from the audience. Um, when folks talk about NIMBYism, do they think the term applies in the same way to um, low wealth people of color communities fighting for power and exclusive wealthier neighborhoods saying no to things? Um, can we tease out this distinction more? So let me put a fine point on that. Should we allow communities that are low income, people of color communities, to have more control over land use in their communities than other, com than other neighborhoods? Comments? I think the, the, the problem is the operative word control. Mm -hmm. There's uh, because of the point you made earlier, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you're talking about restorative justice mm -hmm. and fairness and a recognition that wealthier communities have more political clout, but also more resources and a greater ability to leverage the private marketplace for public benefit, mm -hmm. I think that you then need to counteract those liabilities in a very affirmative way. So that can be um, greater dedication of resources for planning. That can be a, a earlier consultation, especially given the cultural or other differences between the decision makers mm -hmm. and the locality. Mm -hmm. um, it can be um, dedicating capital budgets to deal with the fact it's not just a distribution of the NIMBYs, it's the distribution of the benefits, mm -hmm. which communities get the renovated park, for example. Um, and it can, I would also argue that it's taking advantage of, the re, of civic and local nonprofit organizations because frequently um, in the absence of, let's say, political clout through donations or, oh, we, went to, we both went to Pratt or Columbia or wherever. You know, NYU, maybe. NYU, um, <laughs> that uh, the community development corporations and their like provide a certain type of empowerment and a certain type of comfort level for community people to express their, uh, their outlooks to. So different kinds of engagement, different levels of engagement, but not different levels of control. Anyone disagree with that? Is that? Yeah, that's institutionalized it. control. Yeah. Anyone disagree with that? More public engagement, et cetera. I, I, the one thing I'll add is that I think our current system is basically the opposite of that. 
that systems of, base, of, 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 of local deference um, have the effect of giving stronger veto rights in areas where people are more organized. And so, um, and the, so like, what does local control mean? It means you can't build in Greenwich Village. Mm -hmm. And so, the, um, I mean, maybe unless you're NYU. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, We're not, we don't have time for that. <laughs> um, is any city getting it right? Any promising models of fair, relatively fast, public, inclusive review? Who should we be trying to be? Minneapolis. Minneapolis. So do you want me to do it just passed. It's big citywide region. rezoning that involved uh, as a result of a statewide mandate or region-wide mandate that they have to do so. Um, they, this kind of really cool engagement process. Um, but they um, uh, changed the rules to massively upzone around transit um, and to end single-family zoning for all intents and purposes and allow three apartment uh, triplexes on every single family unit in um, all of Minneapolis. And that's a pretty exciting model. It's citywide, it's focused around transit, but it is also comprehensive. It's a, a very exciting idea, but it comes from a, uh, a, a mandate for replanning. From uh, the state. From the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have a favorite city that we should be looking to? Um, okay, how to best promote neighborhood, racially, ethnic, and economic mixing or integration? And who gets to decide what fair housing means in a community? Mm. Guys are asking small questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, d I don't understand the question because it, it seems to imply that fair housing is, uh, you know, a color of the month or something. Fair housing, now it's this, now it's something else. I, I, don't, I don't get it. Well, I mean, there is a vibrant debate, of course, about whether fair housing is should focus on getting opening up opportunities in for for affordable housing, for example, in neighborhoods that are better resourced, or should give the neighborhoods that aren't well resourced now more resources. Right. So you could have a split in the community about in among neighborhoods about which of those to prioritize. Right. Well, then you're, you're not using fair housing in terms of, uh, historically, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with housing segregation and discrimination. You know, you're talking about uh, fairness. I, I don't know what, what it is exactly, but you're talking about um, having housing available in a variety of communities or something. Yes. Integration, right? Yeah, well, that is integration. I was trying to think of another way to say what the, what okay. the writer might have been talking about. Um, well, I think but I it think wasn't fair house. It's not fair housing in terms of, in terms of the, the Fair Housing Act and fighting discrimination and, and segregation in housing. OK, I, get, I, I take it that the purpose of the question is really to focus this in on who gets to decide, right? If the, let, let's imagine that the state said, um, our definition of fair housing is that every well-resourced community now has to open the doors um, for development that would lead to 10% uh, affordable housing within that neighborhood. Should the state be able to make that decision? Should the city be able to make that decision? Or should neighborhoods have some say in that decision? Okay, I thought we so, had that discussion. Right, I think yeah. we did have that discussion. <laughs> so the question is, is there anything different once you introduce the fair housing aspects of it, specifically? Yeah, it, it gets enormously technical very fast. Um, the ability uh, to, to what, one of the hard things to understand about Matt Laurel is the actual cross-subsidy um, is coming from the increased value of the land. Right. By, because it's associated with an upzoning because we're working within a system where developers have to make the same profit ratio, the architects have to get their same fee for, mm -hmm. for every single unit, the bank gets the same lending, et cetera. So um, to do, uh, it, in some communities to then provide uh, deep discounts in the cost of housing is very viable, in other communities it's not very right. viable. Right. If you wanna build affordable housing in, in a place like Ossining, you have to go to huge densities to get the same number of units, where in Scarsdale, all you'd have to do is add maybe three units 
right. and you can get that same density. Right. So this is a highly technical question. It's a perfect example of where you don't do it as a negotiation uh, based on expediency. You do your homework in advance. You have a set of policies. You can have a series of trade-offs if you do five deep discount, right. you know, five deeply affordable units, or you could do 10 workforce housing units and or 20 what's called least cost housing units. Right. It, um, I don't think it's, it's something where you can decide it on the state. You can, it's a perfect example of where you have to do it through cross acceptance. Okay, if homeowners are overrepresented on community boards, as, as was claimed earlier, how will community board term limits affect affordable housing development? So will limiting the terms yeah. of the community boards so I was just looking up some statistics, and New York City is 55% renters, and that stat only drops to... It's about 70% renters. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> but so what I was just looking at was actually a study of a renter, renting and home ownership across age, and it starts to flip after age 50, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So you can start to think like, okay, so there's term limits. So people maybe are on community boards now who've stayed on them for a long time, who were renters when they got on the board, then they bought in the neighborhood and they've just stayed. And maybe their interests have shifted. But the truth is renters in New York City are not transient. Almost half live in rent-stabilized apartments. And even those that don't either continue to rent or they buy a home. Right, and they stay. So I think term limits will start to shift the demographic. So folks who are older have been on the board, have been there for less time, well, have been there for, sorry, have been there for the termed out time, and then we'll get more renters on the board who are looking at the city differently. Um, let me pick up on something that was said a little bit earlier about uh, what, what should we do to affirmatively further fair housing. Adding affordable housing to places that don't have it is a great idea. Adding amenities to places where low-income folks live so they can feel secure in staying there, that's a great idea. Adding higher-income people to places where low-income people live, that's not a good idea. That's just going to push out the low-income people. Though it does, when okay, you look that, at the Paula, stats... I'm going I'm yeah, right. to rule you out of work. <laughs> we have many, many <laughs> forums chance, so. on fair housing, but, um, but this, this, is a, this is at bottom about fair housing. I want to be clear. Who gets to control is at bottom about uh, our fair, uh, the, how integrated economically and, and racially our neighborhoods become, and we've talked about that. Um, so does anyone think that charter revision will result in a better system? <laughs> Based on what's been discussed, it's almost likely to make a much worse system. Paula? It depends on, you know, if you come out to vote, and it depends on what gets on the ballot. Rick? Low turnout election, open agenda, <laughs> equals disaster. Elaine. I'm going to pass on that one. <laughs> well, let's put it, uh, all right, let me take it up to your level. What if we had a constitutional convention at the state level mm -hmm. to discuss how to deal with the state's affordable housing crisis? Would that make things better or worse? Uh, I think that's a political question in terms of what might you lose if you opened up to have a constitutional convention, you know, along with what might you gain? So, um, also the fear on charter revision, right? Um, right, and it's exactly the same question. Same fear? No, same I say. Mm -hmm. right. John? Net better. Pardon? Oh, in the net better. In the net better because? It's overdue, and I think that there's a, the city's in a very different place than where it was last time. So we can respond better to uh, the trends of the last 20 years. Okay, great. Okay, so I really wanna thank our panel. I can't <laughs> say that we've had a kumbaya moment, but, um, <laughs> but I hope that we have um, laid out really well, the issues um, <laughs> that are confronting us with the charter revision and, and with designing uh, a better system in general. So I want to thank our panelists um, uh, for being thoughtful, provocative. Thank you, Becky. Um, thank you so much. Thank you.